at uh, Meat Factory today. Um, today we have a panel discussion called uh, How to Help Syria or that is part of a civilian march for Aleppo. Thank you for that. Ještě dobrý den. Všichni vás tady chci přivítat a chtěla bych se zeptat, jestli je tady někdo, kdo nerozumí anglicky. Jestli ano, tak tady máme pana tlumočníka, pana Oskara, který stojí tady a kdybyste si k němu někdy sedli někde, tak o taká, pardon, o taká, omlouvám se, nemá jmenovku. Uh, tak vám bude tlumočit privátně. Stojí tady... Kdo má zájem o překlad, tak tady stojí. Stojí tady vpředu v černém, teď je to lépe zabírá, takže se uslyšíme. Takže nikdo. Dobře. So let's turn again in English. Um, at first let me introduce our panelist. The first one is a well-known Czech specialist, Mr. Pavel Gruber, director of organization Medicine Sans Frontier, Czech Republic, Lékaře bez hranic. Um, Mr. Gruber is going to start our discussion with a short description of the current humanitarian situation in Syria. But first, let me introduce our panelist, um, Mrs. Anna Bot, a main coordinator of a Civil March for Aleppo. And I thank you for being thank here. And uh, then Mrs. Zora Hesova is going to come a bit later. Uh, she's a researcher at Association for International Affairs. Hey. Then we have another panelist just coming, young one. <laughs> I'm one class. <laughs> and the last one is Mr. Hamel Youssef co-founder of Syrian non-violence movement and member of the Syrian National Council. So welcome here, all of you. And finally, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Karolina Prokaskova. I'm from Czech TV. Uh, I'm a journalist. I was based last 10 years in Asia. Um, I returned back to Prague and now I'm covering uh, foreign news, mostly news from the Syria. So, my first question is about the current situation and I will give the floor to Mr. Gubner. So please, if you can describe us what is right now happening in Syria, what can we do for Syria, and of course, what is your organization doing? Thank you. So, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for what you are doing. Uh, actually, when I was asked to, to uh, make a brief update about current situation in Syria or in Aleppo, I must say one of the most difficult things is to get independent information from Aleppo, what is happening there. Uh, I must be very honest that the latest update uh, our organization received is from 28th December. So uh, uh, I am not in the position to tell you what's happening there this week, last week. So even though I anticipate that most of you are very well aware of the situation, I think it may be useful uh, to, to provide a brief uh, back or contextual update what was the situation in Aleppo, because it's good to remember what, what the people went through. Uh, actually, the, the siege, the blockade started end of July. Then uh, there was a short period in August uh, when the siege was broken. It was a moment when our organization and few others, it was the last moment when we were uh, able to deliver some medical supply to Aleppo. It was a convoy of 17 trucks with drugs and medical supply. And basically these were the supplies all uh, running hospitals in Aleppo were using all autumn. Then from, uh, from September uh, until December, the whole population of East Aleppo was living under the siege, under the fierce bombardment, which was getting heavier and heavier. Uh, the medical care became nearly inaccessible. All of the remaining health facilities running in Aleppo were hit, some of them more, more time. 
uh, people were facing situation there there was lack of everything uh, you know lack of the fuel was leading to the lack of electricity and a lack of water but it was also for example leading to the situation before when there was a major blast in Aleppo uh, there was not enough of ambulances and there was a lot of civilians uh, who, were he who were helping the, the ambulances to, to deliver the wounded to the hospitals but at the moment when there was no more fuel no more civilians could, civilians could support the ambulances with their private cars so it was one of the consequences that the people couldn't reach the hospitals uh, by December uh, there was one more aspect uh, you know how is it now outside in Prague well the situation at Aleppo is not much different so it was a cold uh, we know the, the city was taken over by the forces uh, connected to Bashar Assad uh, there was an evacuation of the civilians. According to International Committee of Red Cross, the evacuation ended 23rd December. And we know that to Italy province, it was about 36,000 civilians being evacuated. However, nobody knows how many people left to West Aleppo and to areas controlled by the government. And nobody knows how many people moved to West Aleppo. But uh, probably we should be honest, including our organization, that it seems that the number most of us were working with, 250,000 civilians, was, uh, was overestimated. Uh, if you ask me what Doctors Without Borders is doing now, <clears throat> uh, we are present in Idlib province. Uh, uh, when we know the evacuation will, will start, we, we try to reinforce the existing health facilities in Idlib with cargoes of medical supply, with more ambulances. Uh, we started the distribution of non-food items, winter kits. Uh, Basically now uh, we continue to work uh, uh, in, in Italy province. Uh, we are not working uh, in the areas uh, controlled by the forces attached to Bashar Assad. Uh, this is very unusual for our organization because our policy is to provide medical care independent and impartial. Uh, <coughs> doesn't matter on which side of the front line. But uh, since the beginning of the conflict, we were asking the government in Damascus for the permission <coughs> to work also in areas which they control and we never received it until, up until now. Uh, I will finish with this thing because people ask me, what can I do? Well, you do something, you do a lot. But generally what people can do. And I will just talk from the perspective of our organization as a medical organization. Uh, there is generally people agreed more than 150 years ago that when there is a war, war is always dirty. But there is there is a general agreement that <clears throat> nobody is attacking hospitals, their patients, and their staff. This is something which is not working in Syria and in many other countries. <clears throat> we managed to even uh, have a hearing at the uh, Permanent Security Council of the United Nations where our president together with the president of the International Committee of Red Cross delivered a speech uh, reinforcing the feeling how important it is that hospitals are protected. The uh, Permanent Council of the UN then again said yes, uh, hospitals are protected and nobody should be attacking the hospitals. This is the rhetoric. The practice is that four out of the five permanent members of the Security Council are involved in the war in Syria and are actively supporting for, uh, forces which are attacking hospitals. From our perspective, uh, if we see uh, years 2015 and 2016, uh, I must say the situation was really difficult because our hospitals became un came under attack in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Yemen, uh, in Central African Republic, in South Sudan. So uh, if people ask me what to do, I know it doesn't seem a lot, but we can continue the appeal that, every, that all worrying parties, all the parties must respect uh, that, there, that there is no way how to attack hospitals and other civil infrastructure. Maybe with the Syria, this will be my, my last point, uh, the situation is spe even more specific because uh, independence uh, and impartiality of the healthcare was not respected from the very beginning of the conflict. It really started even before the civilian war when the government started, uh, started to hunt the doctors which were, which were giving the treatment to the, to the demonstrators. And in fact, it led to a paradoxical situation because under the Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law, 
the hospital is protected once the position is known. So known. So uh, the, the practice is that the hospital is sharing its GPS coordinates, so all the worrying parties know where the hospital is. But in Syria, the situation was that when the hospital did share the GPS coordinates, the airstrike followed. So now uh, the decision uh, of the hospitals we support is left on the management team and the directors of the hospitals, and almost all of them decided not to share the GPS coordinates because it's increasing the threat of the attack on the hospital. But under the under the international law, it means the hospital is not protected. So it's kind of catch-22 in which Syrian hospitals found, find themselves. Uh, I will end up here. I think it, there, is, there is really an interesting panelist, and hopefully there, there is a space for, for the discussion. Thank you. I'm not going to leave you. I have a few more questions. <laughs> you mentioned the December evacuation. So I would like to know if the eastern part of Aleppo is completely evacuated now, or if you have any information that there are still people who prefer to stay and uh, how there are the conditions now. Uh, I must come back again. Like uh, to be very honest, we don't have uh, we don't have the actu actual information from the East Aleppo. Would we know that probably the city is virtually empty? But this is our suggestion. Are there any other uh, siege city in Syria right now? Well, the, there is many besieged areas. Uh, we operate with the numbers that around 2 million people in Syria is currently living in besieged areas, be it, uh, be it both by, by the rebel forces or by the, by the government army. Uh, when I was looking before this discussion for the data uh, Red Cross is providing, they even estimate 5 million people living in these areas. Any questions? Please, if there are any questions from you, uh, I prefer to have maybe the last 20 minutes for questions, but if there is anything urgent that you would like to ask immediately, otherwise you will forget or fall asleep, just raise your hand and ask. Okay? It's always better to have more lively discussion. second part. We should more talk about the Syria, about the history, about the political situation, and I will invo um, involve our two guests as well. And maybe let's start and talk a bit more about the start of the war. What was the reason, uh, how it developed, and I would like to ask Mr. Youssef if he can tell us more information. How I mentioned uh, he's active, he's one of the activists, uh, his family or friends are still in the Syria, he's in touch with them, so he has some current information as well. Please. Each and every one who is here for his interest in what's going on in Syria. And of course, thank, thanks to the panelists and the moderator. Um, it's uh, sometimes difficult to summarize half a century in five minutes. I guess it's always difficult. But what uh, I can say is that Syria was boiling for a very long time. Uh, Syria was under emergency laws for almost 50 years, half a century, actually. And uh, I believe in 2011 it reached the point of ex explosion, which happened like as another step of this uh, Arab Spring that started in Tunisia. Then it moved into Egypt and uh, Libya, Yemen, and eventually Syria. Um, Syria was practically ruled by one family under military rule. There was no separation of powers, uh, no separation of authorities. Everything is controlled uh, by uh, a group of military men uh, who can overrule even just the system. And uh, people were actually dying or disappearing or being detained for uh, indefinite uh, time or uh, even disappearing. I, I guess I said that already. Uh, 
uh, without anyone able to do anything about it. The what what's different in 2011 or the years leading 2011 was that the number of people who are unemployed, the unemployment in Syria reached very high levels. Uh, when you know that almost 50% of the population or even more are under 30 years old, you will know how much that is, uh, is, is a horrible situation. People didn't have any hope in the future. When you graduate from university, if you could go to study in the university, you have no, actually you have nothing to look for because you cannot afford to buy a car, you cannot afford to buy a house, you cannot afford to get married. The jobs are scarce and the difference between the, those who have money, the rich and the poor, it, it was becoming bigger and bigger uh, by time. Add to that the fact that it was a totalitarian regime, you cannot do anything, uh, NGOs, CSOs were not allowed in Syria, no political parties which are really an opposition parties. Uh, we had like a group of very similar parties to the ruling party, and I'm calling it the ruling party because in the constitution there was an article saying that Al Ba'ath Party is the ruling party in Syria, the only ruling party. The president was the secretary general of the party, he was also the highest leader in military, he was also the highest political uh, position in, in the state, and he had the highest position also in the judicial system the highest court. So actually, one person is controlling everything. And that was the system that Hafez Assad actually gave to his son, Bashar Assad. In 2011, um, people starting, started uprising in, in different countries. Syrian people were looking at them and they, they were telling themselves, it's, it's our turn. And everybody was expecting this moment to happen any time, and that was actually what happened. Maybe uh, all of you know that it started by some children or teenagers in Dara, in southern city in Syria, wrote slogans on the uh, walls of their school about the revolution, about the downfall of the dictator. They were arrested for almost 20 days, even their parents didn't know where they are. And this is documented and it's even admitted by one of the uh, regime's officials. And it's even on YouTube if you like to listen and hear this official say, saying that the children who were arrested, the children who were arrested will be released. So in a state that arrests children, you can expect anything. And in, uh, in the end, all this pressure must explode in the end, and that's what happened in 2011. Sorry if I was long, but... <coughs> Thank you, Bernard. Um, what can you expect in current weeks? What? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, there's a question, so let's, let's ask. Maybe, do you want the microphone? I will give you the mic. <coughs> My name is Anna Hanyukova, and I wanted to ask what was the role of the religion uh, in the beginning of the revolution? I mean, the differences between Shia and Sunni uh, groups, if you could explain something about that. Thank you. <laughs> My friend Anna said I have three hours to explain this. <laughs> I think I need five. Um, the role of the religion. Um, everyone might expect or knows that many demonstrations started from the mosques in Syria. 
does that mean that it is a religious revolution? Not necessarily, because it was the only place where people can gather in big numbers and then go out to the street. And in many cases, our Christian friends, atheist friends, secularist friends came to the mosque, stayed in the mosque. Some of them prayed, some of them just waited on the side until the prayer finished. And then they came out with the rest of the people when there was a demonstration. Maybe you don't know that uh, there was a participation from all uh, religions that are in Syria. We have even people killed martyrs, like Basil Shahadeh, for example. He was Christian, and he was in Homs when he was targeted by a mortar bomb. Another one, which I... Uh, another two, actually. One of them is Father Francis. <coughs> He was also in homes, he was killed. One uh, religious, uh, Christian religious man also in Hama, priest, was killed by a sniper in Hama. Uh, Father Paolo Dalolio from Marmosa convent or monastery disappeared and we are convinced that uh, it was uh, related to the regime one way or another. I had many Alawite friends, Christian friends, non-believers friends, working in the same group that we started, which is called now Syrian Non-Violence Movement. People came from all backgrounds and religions to uh, participate in this national uh, uprising. But. You have also to take in mind to consider that Syria is not a Christian country. She is, uh, Syria is not a Buddhist country. Syria is, by history, by nature of things, uh, has a majority of Muslims who believe in Islam. And when, I think this is more psychological, when people are facing a life or death situation, they go back to their beliefs, the, the faith system, their culture. And of course, when you expect that in two minutes or one hour or whatever, two days, you might be killed because you already saw many people die, you start to think what will happen after I die and, then, and there you will find religion answering telling you that what you are doing is uh, going to be uh, rewarded if it was for good. And no matter what happens with you, you should have patience and don't lose faith. So it's natural for people to resort to their religion, to their belief, to stay strong when no one is helping. And that was the case six months, peaceful demonstrations, snipers killing children, men and women, and I have thousands of YouTube videos, if you like to see, from these first six months, and no one helped. And that was the, maybe the, the gate or the door that was opened for those who cover themselves by, the, by religion to try to achieve their own agendas. We know them, they know that we know them, they know that we don't agree and we even uh, fight or fought them in, in, in many occasions. Uh, Syrian uprising wasn't a religious uprising. There was no problem between Shia and Sunnah in Syria. It was very, I mean, for me it's like uh, really more like sarcasm to say that it, 
that there is a problem between Shia and Sunnah before the uprising. And now, the, the description, this description is actually making things worse, not better. Why? Because I, until this moment, I don't like to describe what is happening as Sunnah against Shia. I have nothing against Shia as a religion or as a sect. Nothing at all. But I have everything against those who are using this cover, describing uh, what is happening in Syria, calling it a civil war. I think the description uh, started being used very early when, when there were no real clashes between Sunnah and Shia or part of the, of, of the Syrian society against another part. That was like not the case. I, uh, I imagine uh, a civil war uh, at least should involve a group of the population attacking another group and then this, the other group will retaliate and so on. This never actually happened on a, uh, at least on a large scale, so it will be called a civil war. Besides, a civil war sh should mean that there is no Iran, no Russia, no Hezbollah, no Al Nujaba, no Fatimiyun, no Abu Fadl Abbas, no all these uh, groups that are fighting for Iran, for Iran's interests inside Syria. And of course, other groups that might be fighting on the other side. This is not a civil war, in my opinion. This is a war against the will of Syrian people who wanted to get back their faith. They wanted to get back their country. Their calls first started saying in Arabic, wahed, 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 shabsui, wahed, which means one, 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 Syrian people are one. You can see that in, in but when you have the strategy of the regime and its allies trying to change this into a fight between Sunnah and Shia and portray it as, it is, as uh, this all the time. And, and then you have groups, militant groups, mercenaries coming and, and raising the flags of Hussein or Zainab or I don't know who, and they are killing, for example, Syrians uh, uh, under this flag they, uh, they brought. Then the, 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 those people will start feeling, oh, it is a religious war against us. It's not, and it's very difficult for people like me to explain to normal Syrians that it is not, because they are they are witnessing crimes against them, somebody killing them, in the name of Ali or in the name of Hussein or in the name of whatever. Um, I still believe that it is not a civil war. I still believe that we should work on explaining this. It is not a religious war or a, or a, a fight between Sunnah and Shia. And uh, hopefully we will give back the, 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 the power and the voice to the civilians who are the majority in Syria, not the fighters anyway. Thank you, Mr. Yusuf. I have one, I'm sorry, devilish question right now. Uh, you mentioned uh, the riots uh, or the protests against Bashar Assad, that they were like the start of this war, civil war. Um, but right now they are mentioning a lot that um, Bashar Assad should, should keep as a president, should be one of the person who should be the leader of the, of, if there will be peace of course, sign. What is your opinion? Uh, who is saying that Bashar should Russian? stay? Okay, I think Russians, they can say whatever they like. It's our country, it's not Russia. If you compare, how many people is for the independent country without President Bashar Assad? And is there, uh, are there groups that okay. are supporting Let him? Let me tell you something. If all of you here tell me that Assad should stay in power, I will, stay, I will say I am against it. If all Syrian people if all Syrian people will say that Bashar should have a share in power, I will go to the streets on my own. 
and say that this guy is a criminal, a killer, a responsible for all deaths, not only the, the people who died on his side, but everyone. Everyone. Why? Because he put himself legally and politically on, in this position. He should be, if, he, if this employee, if this, this Bashar Assad is in the end an employee working for the Syrian people, and when the Syrian people decide we don't want your services anymore, he should step down. Simple. This happens everywhere. Why in Syria this person should stay as a president and everyone is supporting him, knowing that he already committed crimes against humanity and somebody is humoring him or, or entertaining him or whatever, saying, oh, he might be responsible for some orders. We know that he is responsible. We don't need anyone from outside Syria to tell us that this guy is responsible or his group or his gang. It's not a question. It's only a possibility and I am ready to accept it when I want to save my people. For me, Syrian people are taking hostage. All of them, especially those under, under his control. And they need help. Uh, it's not a political uh, difference or d different opinions. It's not politics. This guy is criminal. This is a this is a matter that law should uh, uh, say its word here. Not I. Well, I support Bashar Assad and I don't support him. I will not. I will never support a killer. It's not a political opinion for me. Thank you. Um, when you are talking about the help. I have Anna here, the organizer of the, of the civil march for Aleppo. Anna is one of the person who is helping. So Anna, uh, why are you helping? Why did you organize this march? And yeah, why? Yeah, I feel a bit weird here on this panel because we have two experts here and one person who is not an expert in anything. Um, I, I guess that's that's how it all started, that I'm like all of you here, just an average European who couldn't stand just watching. And um, I, I strongly believe that we as citizens, we can do much more than voting for, for decisive people, that decisive people take decisions and we might not agree with them and in between of the elections we have a right to show that we don't agree. And I don't agree with many things which are happening in Syria. Um, there are many people who decide about it. Um, and it doesn't mean I, as Anna, have to have an answer for it, have to have a solution how to do it, because if I would have a solution, probably I would be an expert in something, <laughs> which I'm not. Uh, but I strongly believe that I have a right to go on the street and say that I don't agree. Um, and I wanted to express that I don't agree and um, suddenly a group of people appeared who, who totally supported me saying we also don't agree, we did demonstrations, we sent petitions, we sent money to different organizations, supported different humanitarian help organizations, but we still feel we can do more, we have energy to do more. Um, so we decided to do more, and we decided to, to make this march, which is, um, which is a bridge, which is a space for discussion, like this, for example, because we would like to force uh, ourselves, our friends, people in our countries, and politicians in our countries, and all the, all the rest of the world, we would like to force to to talk about what is happening because I, I, I can't stand anymore that, that we don't talk about it because it's very important. Uh, can you tell us maybe more about your march? I know that you started in Berlin, part of the people here started with you, but can you tell us what are the plans, where you want to finish your road, uh, where you want to stop, what you want to do on the road? Yes, we started on 26 December from Berlin the idea of the march was born a month earlier, so it was all very fast, uh, 
very unprofessional. <laughs> we didn't have time for organizing much. We, we luckily also didn't have time to think how difficult it can be. I'm not sure if we would have done it, if we would know all these things we know today. Um, and for the last 20 days we are walking. Um, more than 1,500 people already took part in the march. Can you take hands up who already went on the march with us? Just that we see who we have here, look at these people. These people went on the... <laughs> this one too. <laughs> these people went out of their flats and sometimes it was minus 11 and, and they decided to do it. Yes, they decided to show that they don't agree. And where we are going to go? Yes, that was the question. So we are going to Aleppo. Civil March for Aleppo is going to Aleppo and to all other besieged cities of Syria, which is right now it's like 15 other areas. Um, yeah, and, and nothing will change it. So even if today in the magic way everybody would be happy in Syria and you know, all these things we are dreaming about, the peace, democracy, human rights, all this stuff would happen like this, we are still going, because all these years of the war, um, we cannot forget about them. And, and, and things will not change immediately. And the, the, the name Civil March for Aleppo, this for, is important in this name. Because we want to support the people, we want to be solidar with the people, and we want that all these Europeans also talk about it. Can I maybe ask you about the program in Czech Republic? Where are you heading tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow we have a day off, <laughs> which is surprisingly very important, <laughs> especially for the people who for the last 20 days are walking. We walk between 15 and I think 28 kilometers every day. Uh, and it's, it's possible, it's not impossible, but it's tough, yes? And when we walk every day and then every evening we still try to stay with our topic and, and not forget what we are doing. So talk about different guests, like this one for example. <coughs> three days ago you visited us. And then I, th that was my joke about three hours because we had a, a little discussion which ended up I think at one at night. Because all the people, of course, people who take part in March are interested. Yes, they want to get more information. And w what you started at the beginning, that even your organization don't have the the real numbers of things, yes, the real, <laughs> thank you, uh, the real uh, situation, yes, and that even if we want to be involved and interested, we don't have uh, a, a real sources for all the information. And then it's also easier to ignore it, it's easier to say, I'm not, you know, I cannot find the proper information, so I ignore what is happening. We cannot ignore it. Uh, yes, but <laughs> I'm, I'm far away from the topic. Tomorrow we have day off, uh, which means we, we do the washing uh, and we sleep a bit longer. And then what is happening, wait, I, I got a mobile phone from my daughter. Mm. She knows. <laughs> Her father knows. <laughs> um, uh, day after tomorrow uh, we start at 9. And we go to Rikane, yes, I don't know how to pronounce it. Rikane. So Rikane, yeah. And then, and then we walk again every day, more or less 20 kilometers, still, still 12 days in Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. um, and of course it's nice that media all around the world are talking about the march. But what is important, I think, what is the most important for all of us is that you all guys join us. Because this march doesn't make any sense if there is five people walking and 10,000 people talking about it. If you really want to show that you support us, just, just come on the next day after tomorrow and come even for a day with us. So thank you for your day. Uh, when we are talking about the health, you are doing something, but I would like to ask Mr. Gruber, what is needed right now in Syria? If we, if we can walk, that's one thing, but if you would like to send some money or maybe help in different ways, how can we help as a Czechs or European citizens? Well, the answer could be one word, everything. 
So, uh, you know, the, the situation is so desperate that it, it's very difficult to say whether to put first medical aid or food or security or protection. It's simply everything. Uh, <clears throat> from our perspective, uh, if you ask me what's needed in Syria, I would say the the, the biggest help to the civilians of Syria would be if all warring parties start to respect humanitarian aid, impartiality of medical aid, which is not happening. And it, because it, it, uh, under normal circumstances, I think Syria would be the biggest operation of ML of doctors without borders ever. But due to the security situation, it's not possible. So uh, it would be a step one. What, what the Czechs could do, it's rather difficult because uh, we had the internal discussion because people were uh, approaching our organization, for example, asking, is there any appeal for Aleppo? Can you, are, are you planning to collect money for Aleppo? And, and we said, no, we cannot because we can't work in Aleppo. We can't, we can't access people in Aleppo. So we, we would find it very unfair to ask people to contribute us for Aleppo if we know about ourselves that we are not able to deliver the aid there. Yeah, exactly. On this I wanted to, to say something, because when we created our group who wanted to do something, we were thinking, like, should we support some organization to collect money or to collect medicine? We got in contact with very different organizations in Syria and in, on the border with Turkey, and they told us, yes, you can collect money, but what can we do with it if we cannot access people? And this was... It, what touched me the most when, when I started this idea was that there are the civilians like me who cannot be helped. Yes, and organizations, huge, very important organizations who are there on the spot, they cannot access them. And what to do? Yes, like I will not run around in Syria and, and make the, the space that they can go with their cars. So we were thinking how we can do it. Yes, how we can create the pressure to do something. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, yeah uh, I would like to ask uh, what is the plan when you get to Aleppo? So what do you do there? Do you want to get to the city? Or? Really want to get to the city? Or? Do you want to get into the city? Yeah, we're going to hug everybody in Aleppo. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very uh, tricky and difficult question. And I also see that many people start from the end of our project, this Aleppo, yes, what will you do there? It's also a lot about the way. It's very much about the way and about what is happening on the way. What, what I can say for sure, I don't want to put anybody off of the group or myself in the risk. I also don't want to make troubles. Yes, I don't want that anybody has to help me or share food with me. We don't want to make troubles. We want to make these guys like, like them uh, be able to help. Yes, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that, that many people ask us this question. Like, what are your skills to really help in Aleppo? I believe that everybody should do what he's able to do. And what I'm able to do is to walk. To walk and talk with very different people on the way and to motivate them to, to get information and to, to, to question things, to, to meet different people on the way. Already on our way, first through Germany, we were meeting many Syrian refugees. For many people on the march, it was first opportunity in their life to meet Syrian person. In some town, I don't remember where already, Syrian people came to the market square where we arrived and invited us to their homes. For many people, it was the first time in their life that they could spend time with Syrians. And this is very important for me. And right now, I don't want to think about what will happen in five months, because we know that the situation in Syria is super changing. So we have in our team, we have the group of people who think about different strategies and different opportunities, what will happen then. But for now, the way is the most important. Maybe uh, if I may just add one word on the, on the help. Uh, because when we, when we talk about how to help these people, uh, I try to always repeat and, and to remind everybody that we also should keep in mind the people uh, who help in Syria. 
I'm sorry, because of medical, I, I'll talk again about medicals, but most of the help is done by the Syrian doctors and Syrian nurses who stay, who stayed in Aleppo, who stayed in many other areas, and they work under the conditions none of us can imagine. Uh, they don't have supply, they don't have, uh, they, they don't have barely anything, and they still stay and still try to fulfill their mission, it means to, to save lives. And just imagine the, the, the moment which is happening in any Syrian hospital. Everybody now knows that the hospitals are targets. Even it happened to us in one city where, where we helped to renew the hospital. The local population demonstrated against the hospital being in their quarter. Imagine, this is, this is unbelievable, because they know the hospitals are targets. So imagine being a doctor or a nurse in Syria. You every day go to your work and you know you can be bombed and it can be your last day. So when we talk about the help, please also think about these people because they, they do most. It's uncomparable to any, any of us. Please. Talking about Aleppo, we just a few minutes ago we talked uh, about the situation in the eastern part, which is probably uh, completely abandoned. So uh, my question is where the people from the eastern Aleppo went? Are they mostly in the western part of the city? And I would like to know what's the situation there? Uh, if the people are getting uh, some proper treatment, or uh, what's the what's the uh, how did the people from the western Aleppo uh, accepted the people that were taken there from the eastern part? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mr. Joseph, please, if you can answer. The, what will happen to those people who will stay under, under his control? So people will not choose to go back in general to areas that regime is controlling. Unfortunately, the western parts or some people in, in West Aleppo were celebrating while all kinds of militia that are fighting alongside Assad and the Assad uh, fighters were taking the, the eastern part of Aleppo, one neighborhood after one uh, after another. Uh, we have a huge um, problem uh, in this regard, but uh, I always say that even those people or some who were in the streets celebrating and chanting for the victory over those besieged people for like three months, besieged people, no water, no, no, no electricity, no hospitals, no food. Uh, some of them were pushed to show their joy because the, 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 the Syrian TV wanted to take some shots of how Assad forces uh, prevailed over the terrorists and all this propaganda. Um, I can mention examples from the areas that are under the Assad control and how people are suffering already there. How people are not able to express their, for example, solidarity with their own families who are under the, uh, who are besieged in other areas. How many of them are being arrested and disappearing or somebody in the middle of the night will come with uh, the ID of their son telling them you can receive his corpse but you have to bury it in the night and only two people can go to the cemetery to bury them. <coughs> Assad is, I mean, I mean for us Assad is, is worse than the worst. And I don't think that there will be a chance for it. it sh there shouldn't be a chance for a, this kind of person, this kind of regime to continue. And it's affecting everyone. It's affecting even Europe here. The, 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 the effect of this horrible uh, creature is, is reaching even Europe. Um, I am sorry, I need to say one, one, one last thing which is, might be positive uh, after all this 
blackness. We have a say uh, from the Islam traditions or a say from the Prophet. He said, if Judgment Day started, if Judgment Day started and you have a seed in your hand you want to plant in the ground, do it. Do it, even if Judgment Day already started. So what those people are doing is important, even if they didn't reach Aleppo, even if they don't know what to do next step. They already started. It doesn't matter what happens later. Of course it is good to know what will happen. But it's better to do something good than just even to watch the end. And that's it. Thank you. That's what we need to hear, especially about the Assad and the regime. Thank you for that. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Gruber if he can add something about the situation in the western part of Aleppo. Do you have any information from your staff? Uh, you mentioned that they are mostly Syrians. What is happening? What are the people facing right now? You also mentioned that the winter is coming and it's quite cruel. So what is happening? Uh, <clears throat> no, I, I'm sorry again. We can't say anything about Western Aleppo because we are not allowed to access it since the beginning. So, uh, yeah, well, in Idlib we have our teams. Uh, the situation in Idlib uh, is difficult as well because uh, even the hospitals in Idlib are being targeted and are being hit. Um, but generally, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we reinforce the, the, the medical teams in Idlib where we expected the, the people from, from Eastern Aleppo to go. So now, and, and, I, and again, there is an important thing, you know, we are definitely not the only organization. There is many other organizations in Idlib working, so I don't want to create a picture that we, we are the, the only one, but that there is many. Uh, so there is given some, some needed care to these people in terms of winter and, and health care. Uh, yeah, but, but as I say, the, the hospitals over Idlib are targets as well, so going to hospital in Idlib is as, as dangerous as, uh, as it was in Eastern Aleppo. And maybe I would just add to the, to the question before, you know, uh, where these people go. I mentioned it at the beginning. The only official number was given by the World Health, World Health Organization, which said that 3,426 families which represents about 36,000 people reach Italy province. Thank you. Yeah, there's one question over there. I would like to ask what is the plan for tomorrow and uh, at what time exactly because I think it's on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so tomorrow is the rest. And Maybe, 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 we'll keep, can maybe we can give first. microphone to, to, to Katarina, she is our, our check master, thanks to who all happened here. Thanks a lot, Katarina. Hi, I would just like to add that tomorrow at 5.30 there is a gathering at Hrachanske Namieski right next to the Prague Castle. It's a beautiful place and there will be a vigil for all the people who died in Aleppo and who suffered from the difficult situation. So we would like to welcome, to, to invite everybody to come tomorrow 6.30 to Hachon's Castle. Five, six, five, 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 Five thirty. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I should stop organizing today. I'm so tired. <laughs> Thank you. One more question over there. Yeah. Hello. My name is Benjamin. I'm from Berlin, um, but I did not walk even uh, a tiniest part of the road. We uh, came here yesterday, just walked a little bit. Um, I was very moved uh, by the uh, 
the way the civil march was is organized that it is to what I understand not political so you see people suffering you don't know what to do you don't know who to trust so you go there even if you don't reach it that touched my heart and it, it, it moves me and, I, and yeah there's one thing though that I have to ask you right now because now I'm a little confused listening to you especially you, the gentleman from the opposition in uh, Syria, where is the the person on the panel that represents the other side? Like, if we go into politics, if we do talk about, you know, reasons and not just walk there, which would be enough for me, but if we do politicize the whole situation, where is the person that has the chance to defend the other side on the panel? I guess it's a question to the organizers of the panel. <laughs> I don't know what to say. When we learned that this march is being organized, like we got together and made a team of people who would like to support the idea. And I guess there was just like nobody from the other side, so they are not here. Did you ask them? Well, I don't know anybody who represents the other side, so I don't know. Maybe they are calling right now. It's Facebook Live. Any other question or the gentleman over there? Maybe I will leave the microphone over there. Oh, my name is Erian Karov. I uh, have maybe, it's not really an answer, but I'm also one of coordinators, coordinators from the Czech side. And uh, I'm not sure that I know anybody who can defend the other side. So I do have some uh, friends and some people I know from Syria, but I don't think we are re really able to find someone who can, can be representing the other side. But can I say something? Maybe they are not in Prague, actually. Um, I do not uh, feel or uh, consider myself representing one side in Syria. I feel that I care for each Syrian in Syria, whether on the opposition, I don't like the word opposition by the way, it's not a political thing what's happening in Syria, it's the people of the country trying to be alive again. All of them, and for all of them. We are calling as opposition, if you like, for a country that everyone, each one, is equal under the law, all have the same chances, all have respect, all have uh, dignity, and a democratic process. This is what we are calling for. I don't know who will be on the other side of this kind of uh, rhetoric. Government, but, government. but what government? A government that used the, the military against its own people? Exactly. And they, you think they have right to defend themselves? Absolutely. Okay, so add to that Iran representative from Iran, representative from Russia, representative from Hezbollah, representative from Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, representative from al-Nujaba, representative from ISIS, representative from al-Nusra, representative from, I can mention now, 40 foreign groups that are fighting in Syria. You want all 40 to be on this table to say that this is a political opinion? Yes. Yes, because either it is civil or it is political. 
It's, it's not political. This is the point. What is happening in Syria is not political. Exactly. That's why... It's a, it's a people who want to be free again, and unfortunately people do not understand this. People think that uh, the problem with Assad is that he has a, uh, an imagination or strategy to rule the country or whatever, uh, and some other people who have different opinion, and they are fighting over power. I was in prison for one year because I was reading a book in 1990. I was arrested in 2000. My father is, 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 is disappeared in 1980 because he was a writer. Who can defend this? Half of or third of Hamas city was paved on the ground like for, uh, with, with tanks and artillery. 40,000 people were killed there. Nobody asked for their opinion. Yeah, what is their opinion in 11,000 uh, prisoners killed under torture? What is your opinion? I, I don't what do you think? Is, you think it's okay? No, you don't understand. I don't have an opinion. That's the, that's the point. It's, it's you don't have... Okay, I am just telling you. What do you think about 11,000 prisoners killed uh, under torture? Is that okay? But it's okay. What, what do you mean by okay? I mean sad and grief and what? I'm sorry. Is it I'm justified? Going to you and Is it justified? I'm sorry because I would like to introduce okay. you someone as well. There is a researcher from AMO Institute, um, Madame Zora Hesova, uh, Association from International Affairs. So she's welcome as well, and she can ask uh, the question as well as a researcher and professional who is covering the Syria right now in a Syria uh, situation. So, one more person, and I'm sorry that I interrupt you, we will have a time later to discuss it, maybe just between us. used against civilians, but probably, you can expect that, and those who understand Syria more than me are actually saying that, this will be applied in other places as, 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 as the, the government party takes more and more territory. Um, we can, what, what civilians can do outside of Syria is to keep uh, showing, firstly, uh, we'll keep speaking about what is what this kind of violence against civilians and secondly trying to help those who are fleeing because this will probably uh, just continue and mean even get, get worse. Uh, only a humanitarian pressure and pressure uh, on those warring parties to let in humanitarians uh, let in help, let in the UN or so Tisni and so on is probably the only thing that we can now do to strengthen this aspect of the humanitarian side. Otherwise, politically, it's really difficult to uh, first get a clear idea of what you um, what is happening. Secondly, even more impossible to find some part that you would find uh, worth supporting. And thirdly, absolutely outside of civilians means is to try to in, in, have an influence of what is happening in Syria apart from this humanitarian aspect. Um, I would like to ask one question and then you would like to talk as well. I'm sorry the lady over there. Um, when we are talking about the Assad government, what about you as a well-known organization? Can you talk or at least negotiate with them? Is there any way? <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, generally it was also my reaction towards what was said and towards the heated discussion before. Uh, I didn't step into it, but I, because I had the tendency to take it automatic, but I think it's important to remind that humanitarian aid uh, must be totally impartial and independent. That's why Doctors Without Borders never take sides. In any conflict we don't take sides. In our charter it's clearly said that uh, we exist to provide medical care to those who can't access it irrespective of race, religion, political interest, and so on. Uh, so to, to answer your questions, uh, yes, we try to talk with Assad, we try to talk with, with the government in Damascus since the beginning of the conflict. Uh, it's, a, it's not an easy, uh, easy topic to discuss. 
but it's the same situation in many conflicts. We simply need to talk to the bad guys if you want to get the access. And we want to get to the access because we know that there is thousands of people who need the, desperately the help. So since the beginning, we were asking the government to access to, to work on the both sides of the front line. As I mentioned in the beginning, up until now, we have not received it, but uh, we are not giving up. But uh, it's similar, you know, like people often ask, for example, do you talk to Taliban in Afghanistan? We say yes, of course. Well, we need to be sure that all worrying parties are respecting us, and only at this moment we may open our hospital. Thank you. And the lady in the second row, I'm sorry for a long time waiting. No, that's fine. Uh, hi, my name is Magda. I didn't really have a question, I just had a plea and a favor to ask, because I think one of the main things that we want to achieve is open this floor to dialogue. And if people have doubts, and if people have questions, we don't want to disregard them. And even though we might have different opinions, if we want peace, and I don't mean just in Syria, I don't mean just for Syrians, but in general, we need to learn to also be peaceful when we talk to one another. So I just wanted to react in a situation where someone felt safe enough, and that's great that they did feel safe enough to ask a question that could have been very unpopular, and then they were kind of attacked. And I just wanted to say that I wish we could talk in a different way. And I wanted to thank, I'm sorry, I don't see the name because I'm kind of blind, but Zora Hesova. Um, Ms. Mrs. Zora, thank you very much for what you said. And I'm also one of the organizers from the core team of the Civil March of Aleppo. And this is exactly what we've been saying all along, that we know this, this conflict is so complicated, we will not get into that. Yes, we will try to educate ourselves. Yes, we will try to listen to different opinions. That's why we welcome questions and we want everyone to feel safe to ask them. But what we can do is not influence any rebel groups. We will not influence Assad or anyone else. What we can do is focus on the civilians. And I think for a part of this conversation that got lost. So I just wanted to address that and also thank you for asking that question because again, we might have different opinions but we need to feel safe to ask and to express and to doubt because this is what a debate is. It's not only answering the questions that are easy and that are on our side or whatever we choose to believe, it's about being able to communicate. And for me, this is also peace. And this is what we're learning in this march because we're not taught to communicate without aggression, without jumping to conclusions, without wanting to convince another of our opinion. We're not taught to listen and to communicate. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Thank you as well. And of course, we have, uh, the time is running, so we have another 10 minutes approximately for questions. So I'm sorry, now I will pass the microphone over there and then will be time for your question. Um, I want to remind everyone here that <coughs> there were almost four attempts at a political solu solution in Syria. First by the Arab League, second by Kofi Annan, third by Lakhdar Ibrahimi, and lastly, the Geneva one, two, and I don't think there is a three, but there is a three coming or four, whatever. And all of them were uh, by an, uh, the opinion of those who are, were sponsoring them uh, were failed because the Assad regime didn't comply. Last. What, you, what we are witnessing, that there is a ceasefire in Syria that everyone ag agreed to, but in the end we find that the Assad regime is not respecting it. This is a fact, this is not my opinion. You can search it, you can find it. Now, if you want to... Uh, it, the principle of having uh, both parties on the table to express their, their own uh, stance and opinions is totally accepted. This is not uh, an issue. But what 
is uh, uh, sensitive is that to say you are uh, only uh, letting one opinion <coughs> speak and not the other, and this is not the case. Because the call for this activity for for the march for the civil march for Aleppo was very long time uh, announced on internet, and we tried to spread it everywhere, and definitely. The other side knew of it, and one sign that they knew of it, that there was one lady today marching with the Syrian uh, flag, or the Assad flag, whatever it's called, the old, the, 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 the official red flag, uh, marching in front of the people, and somebody was taking picture. So they know. And I don't, I doubt that if they will approach the organizers, they will tell them, no, you will not have a place to, to talk. But I also uh, suspect that they, that they, they will be in, uh, brave enough to sit on the same table and even just mention the facts. I have nothing about, against having another opinion sitting on the same table. Thank you and, and, uh, and, and sorry if you felt attacked or something. The man in the last row in the gray sweater will be the first question and then the lady over there in the red. Thank you. Hello. Oh, good, this is working. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Anna, thank you very much for organizing something like this. Your heart's obviously in the right place. Uh, my name is James. I'm an expert military officer and I work in Iraq. And I thought I'd come down here and speak to you guys this evening because I'm a little concerned about what you're doing. If you like him, you'll love me first. <laughs> and it's good that you guys are looking for dissenting opinions because I'm quite worried about. What where you're going at the moment with this, somebody's going to get hurt, did you know that? We do. You do? And you think that's a good thing, do you? Is the problem... Have you been already answered this question before? I must have missed it. I'm sorry. So if you humor me, thank you. So I can tell you in a second. Okay. Also, the, one of the biggest concerns that I've got is you're detracting from other charities that are actually working in the area by taking a little bit of the, for instance, you guys have got quite a good fundraiser going, I notice, and you're raising quite a lot of money with an unclear perspective of what you're going to do with it. Um, there's medical facilities that really, really need funding. I've seen people dying who require medical treatment that aren't getting the funding. And then you guys are walking across Europe and raising, raising money for a very unclear reason. Um, Very clear reasons. We mentioned what we are raising money for, and we're going to spend it on this, showing the bills. What is unclear here? What's unclear is that, number one, you haven't actually done anything yet except walk. Number two... <laughs> oh, hey. this I don't agree with. Well... I'm, I'm very glad that I'm glad you came before me because you made me feel a lot more confident to talk about this with the dissenting well, opinion. I, you may recall I said no aggression and no accusing people and okay. being open. So it doesn't. You think this is aggression? You wait until you get to Syria. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go to questions because yeah, we have like last ten minutes. So the, and another my, people waiting. So okay. My, my point. Can... My point is this. I just want. I just hope that you guys are aware of what's going on down there and. Uh, you're going down there with, with zero experience of the area. And I noticed that you're blocking, for instance, I don't see many Syrian people here. I noticed that you had Syrian people march with you that actually left your march, because apart from a few of you... Hang on a second. Sorry, just, just a minute. As you go, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes, sorry. Just a question. Can I ask a question? Yes, your group. Uh, there's some hashtags running on, on Facebook that aren't overly impressed with what you're doing. Our group, the company I work with, reached out to you, had their reply deleted off your Facebook page. Uh, we can talk about that person if you'd like, but I don't want to bring it up here. And what my basic concern and question is, is are you aware of the fact that there are other people working in the area trying to make a difference and that by organizing something like this you can slightly muddy your waters? And if any one of your people get hurt while you're doing it, this is also going to detract from people that are actually there and working in the area. Yes, I am aware about what is happening in Syria. That's the first answer. Yes, I am aware that there are other organizations raising money for different things. Yes. Yes, but beyond that, are you aware of what's happening by the fact that you're creating a new group, a new organization, 
and you're not really bringing any attention to some of the groups that are working there. I believe we create a lot of attention on things which are important for us and I don't see anything wrong in it. Are you aware of the dissension of other groups that aren't overly happy with what you're doing? Have you been following the hashtags on, on Facebook that aren't happy? Okay, let's talk about Facebook later on, yeah, with Anna personally. And I'm sorry, you have already four questions and there are people who didn't have time for any. So, if you don't mind, we will pass. Thank you for your question. Next one, the lady over there in front in the red shirt, please. Maybe I can... She's very helping people coming from detention camps uh, going to Germany. But my question is uh, for my department. I'm a member of the Women's Right and I would like to focus on women's uh, situation. Uh, I, the last uh, family I had at home, they were telling uh, their story and the last thing they moved them on the uh, way to Europe was that there were uh, several women uh, taken into the prison. So I would like to ask if uh, what was the situation and what's the purpose to take women into the prison? And uh, if you are uh, aware of special situation of women in Syria, Maybe we I didn't like, understand. Um, why women are taking into the prison? You know, because uh, I've heard that uh, mm, story. So uh, I think a lot of people don't know what's going on with women. If that the regime is how is misusing women for their purposes. So I think okay. if you can comment on that. Okay. Um, um, of course, there were many cases of uh, documented cases of uh, women arrested in Syria, and also uh, part died under torture. Um, there is a, there are reports of systematic uh, violation of, of uh, well uh, systematic rape, if you like, uh, in, in prisons for women. And uh, we have stories about uh, uh, about this. Um, I don't think this is the first time uh, using women as a way to pressure. Sorry. It's a, it's a mechanism of war. Yeah, I think it's it's happening in in, in probably many many places. Uh, or had happened before as a tactic to put pressure on, on the people. Uh, in our case, in Syria, this is not uh, something strange. We know that sometimes women are captured to put pressure on their old family. And, and, and so uh, it's a horrible situation. It's not only women. There are children also in, in prisons, not only women. Some, some give birth in detention and they grew up like one or two years inside the prison, the children. So it's, um, you know, sometimes uh, these things that I know and I assume that people know that these things that make me sometimes very emotional, how can you talk about something like <laughs> so intellectual while these things are happening? And you think it's uh, sometimes only a political dif different opinion or something. It's not. Uh, I hope the situation will be better. Uh, and, and this uh, will, will happen if there, were real, if there was a real pressure on the Assad regime. And uh, this uh, initiative uh, might in the end uh, succeed in putting pressure on. And uh, maybe we will talk about it or not later. Uh, time is up, but okay. Last question, please. Last two questions. The ladies over there. So the first lady in the, in the first row, and then the lady in the second row, please. Hello, I am from Syria, 
And I would like just to comment on his uh, questions because he was saying that there are very Syrians uh, uh, participating in this march. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, like tell you that there are really few Syrians here in Czech, and uh, Czech is actually not accepting refugees. So this is like the first reason. And the second reason, I believe, this march is not is not about Syrian people. Syrian people are not asked or they don't have to participate in this march. This march is from Europe and to European people and it's walking the way through their country to, to grab the attention and to raise the awareness and to educate European people about this, these people who have to walk this way from Aleppo to Berlin or whatsoever. So I don't think this is really a bad thing or any negative point that Syrians are not participating. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much our panelists, thank you very much Anna for organizing uh, the march for Aleppo and this panel discussion and how I heard uh, there should be concert after that. Mr. Marvan, if I'm right, he's going to play for you, but of course we can discuss, you can come and reach any of our speakers and ask a question after that. And Ashraf from Yemen, with another singer. Okay, advice. So, Thank you, and maybe the last sentence or word that everybody wish here. Let's hope that Syria finds a path to keep peace or and change for the better. Thank you. Thank you.